From the news team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday, our show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. Now, here's a question for you. What would you give to make your hobby your job? Today's guest is Tom Deacon. Tom's passionate about farming. He's got a full-time job with HBO, and that's has, not had, and more on that later. But for now, here's what's key. Tom started his first farm out of the second bedroom of a Westchester apartment. It was a hobby and a way to know more about what he and his family ate. Five years later, it's taken over his life in great ways. Tom still lives in Westchester. He and a small team run his farm, Fable, in a town called Ossining. He's still producing trailers and promos for HBO. And if that sounds like he works two full-time jobs, well, you're not wrong. Now, Tom's proof that your passion can become a second career, a gratifying one, but it will require you to take initiative and you'll make mistakes along the way. And it will be a lot of work. Here's Tom. There's a crew of about five of us that run a small farm in Westchester County, New York. Um, we grow some field crops. Um, depending on the season, we, we've dabbled into hydroponics. Um, we raise chickens. We have about 500 free range chickens. And uh, we run what's called the CSA, which stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And um, that's where members pre-purchase their produce for the season. And it helps us grow the crops, um, buy seeds, irrigation, uh, the labor to do that. And then to provide that, um, the crops to them uh, the following season. And we also sell to a few restaurants in the area as well. So what have the last couple of months been like? Very interesting. Um, As you can imagine, most farms, especially in the north, um, they always have a tough winter. That's actually why I I think that's why a lot of farms do a CSA is to be able to help us get through the winter, um, repair irrigation and equipment and um, plan for the following summer. Um, So every winter is incredibly hard. A lot of the restaurant accounts kind of slow down a little bit as well. They're not purchasing as much food or um, because they're not seeing customers as well. Um, so we were kind of excited to come back this year um, into the, the spring and summer. We started raising more chickens. We upped the amount of chickens we had from 200 to 500. Um, we started beefing up our crew. And then this uh, pandemic happened, which has been incredibly interesting and tough and a roller coaster ride for sure. So 200 to 500 chickens. I mean, you were hitting the big time there, Tom. Yeah, I mean it's it's funny when I um I, I never imagined having chickens. <laughs> um I went to my first uh, I was growing hydroponically, I was doing a bunch of herbs and leafy greens and I would constantly go to farmers markets and there was next to no egg vendors. No one was really selling eggs and if they did, they sold out very quickly. So I honestly didn't know what I was doing, but I said let me get 30 chickens and and I got them and sure enough we would go to the farmers market and in an hour they would sell out. Um so slow and steady, we decided to start raising our own and picking very specific breeds that lay different colored eggs. So we have a green egg layer and a blue egg layer, and it's really neat. And um, what we will really like is that to have organic chickens, uh, organic eggs, and to have them free ranging, it costs more. Um, and luckily, the local community here is really supporting that. Um, so we don't battery cage our chickens. They're all free ranging, and it's, it's, a, it's really a great thing. This conversation is from May. Remember May? In Westchester, things were still locked down. And like a lot of us, when the pandemic hit, Tom wasn't entirely sure what he was going to do. Restaurants were closing down. No one was going out. And in one week, all of the restaurants that used Tom's farm, they all canceled their orders. It was terrifying. And then a weekend or so later, Tom noticed a change in the market that they run on the farm. Everything went. We had a flood of customers. Uh, It was like two to three times the amount of customers, if I remember correctly. Then we realized the whole um, social distancing was taking place. So we started to ask customers, you know, only our our barn is very, the the market in our barn is very small. So we would only allow a few customers in at a time. And then the the line went out the road because everyone was six feet apart. Um, And we realized this isn't really sustainable either. I mean, people were, it was taking two hours for people to getting produce. Did you have enough? Uh, well, so one of the great things I started to do th- three years ago was work with other local farms in the area because I knew I'm never going to, at least anytime soon, I'm not going have, to have cows and do milk. So we started to work with a local milk vendor and a cheese maker and a bread maker. And so what's kind of cool about our CSA is you can use your CSA membership to purchase anything from any local farm or small business. 
Um, so we started reaching out to all the vendors saying, yeah, we're going to need three times the amount of muffins. <laughs> we instituted um, barnside pickup or curbside pickup. Um, so now people order online, they pop open their trunk, we drop their bag in and they leave. And it's, we still have a line out the door. It's crazy, but um, it's, it's heartwarming because it saved us in a way. So as you tick through these things that you've instituted, Barnside pickup, you know, maybe curbside deliveries, that's a lot of change to happen really, really fast uh, at a business, even in the best of times. And you're at a business that I assume is under a lot of the strains that most small businesses are under. What was surprisingly easier than you thought? And what was surprisingly harder? I'm going to have to get back to you on the easier side of things because <laughs> nothing has been easy at the moment. Um, well... I'll give a little, I, I got to give some credit to um, Square. We use Square for our online, like, you know, our ordering system. Um, and they must have released a beta version of curbside pickup because they said, like, here, here's a curbside pickup option. We're releasing it right now. It's not exactly ready, but use it. Um, and we are. And it, it's, it's worked out fairly well, um, especially if it's some sort of beta that they released. So I got to give some credit to Square for that because that helped us out because otherwise... I don't know how I would have released curbside pickup exactly. In terms of the hard side of things, it's, I mean, like, you know, between losing all our restaurant accounts was, was tough. Um, you know, managing all of our, we, most farms I know are running, are operating with a ton of debt. <laughs> um, you know, so, so handling our, our, our loan payments is difficult. We, we applied for the, um, I know the, the government released those uh, small business loans. We applied and haven't heard back. So that's, um, you know, we're, we're hoping that that is something that we have access to in the, in the near future. And then the, the demand is the other hard thing, because I, I feel horrible. You know, we'll ask the local baker for, you know, she had to maybe she doesn't have the staff or she doesn't, you know, maybe her and her staff don't feel comfortable baking in, in such a small environment. So she can only provide me with 20 loaves this week and we have 300 customers coming. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, luckily all the guests of the farm have been incredibly understanding and patient with the obstacles, you know, whether it's us forgetting to throw something in their bag or us have selling out constantly of milk and cheese. So, um, so it's been a roller coaster for sure. What's it been like to manage employees through this? Um, it's, it's difficult because you, you want, you don't like, you want to make sure everyone's safe and healthy. Like that's everyone's important, the most important thing right now. And it's wear a mask, you know, be six feet away from each other. And then it's like, you have to lift something heavy. You know, like what, what do you tell them? Like, don't, don't go feed the chickens because you can't be three feet apart. You know, so it's, it's, um, that's been incredibly difficult. Um, we had one, um, um, staff member lose a family member recently. So that was tough. Um, so it's, it's really, uh, this is really an interesting time and it's a difficult time to kind of, um, get through, but, uh, I mean, our crew has been great and our, our, our customers have been great. So we, you know, we're, we're very lucky in, in particular. Um, it must feel in moments like this, like your customers are, they have a much closer role to your, to your business. They might even feel like it's like a sense of ownership over your farm sort of ownership over the community. Are they stepping up? You can see on our, our store page, you know, we're selling out of, of items left and right, but people are still signing up for CSA memberships. And to me, that's like an investment. That's like an investment in the farm because you say, um, I want to support you so that you can go another season. Even uh, like on social media, you know, a lot of them are, are you know, complimenting us saying, don't, you know, don't worry, you guys are kicking butt. And we, we, we appreciate that because that's, that's, um, again, it's heartwarming because they, they've been incredibly patient and understanding with all the obstacles that we're dealing with. So it's, it's, um, you know, they're supporting us and we're supporting them, I hope. So it's, it's a good, you know, mutual relationship. What are you thinking most about as we begin to work our way out of this for your business? Thinking most, I just want things to go back to normal. I, I miss, you know, like one of the things I, I really like about the farm is the atmosphere and the environment. And, you know, I really want to turn it into something where, where, kids like I, I have a, my son's turning two, where, where children could come to learn they could feed the chickens and, and so I just want that for because to see people drive into the farm open up their trunk and leave is it, it, it's great because we're providing people food in a safe way 
but I'd much rather see kids walk up to the fence and feed the chickens, you know, like, like I, I, I miss that sense of a place to go on Saturday mornings. Um, so that's what I'm kind of looking forward to again. Now I want to shift gear a little bit, Tom, mm-hmm. and I want to go back to your, your early days as a farmer. And so what I understand is that you actually prepared for and thought you would have a career in media. Maybe you still do. I was reading about all the pesticides in the food system and it started to scare me as I was getting married and having kids. And like, I, I don't know what I'm ingesting in my body, what my wife is. And if she, when she's pregnant, what's going into the baby. So, um, I just started to grow on my own. It was a few like potted plants, you know, some herbs and tomatoes. Um, and I, at the time I was living in a two bedroom co-op, a two bedroom apartment. And, um, so outside on the patio, I was growing these things. And then the winter came and I still wanted those fresh, the fresh items. So, uh, fresh produce. So I turned my, my spare bedroom into a little science lab. I bought some grow lights and some hydroponic towers. And next thing you know, I have kale and spinach and basil in the middle of winter in New York. <laughs> but it was urban enough that you were living in a sort of two-bedroom apartment. And your, your first farm was actually the spare bedroom? Uh, yeah, I never thought of it that way. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. What, what would you have described as your career at that point in your life? And was it satisfying to you? Uh, yeah, I, w- I was a film editor. I, I loved it, still do love it. Um, uh, I'm a producer now at, at a, a different um, studio, but I, um, yeah, I was a film editor and I uh, loved what I did. I always said to myself, if this is what I do the rest of my life, I'm completely happy doing it. Um, and I would say I'm just fortunate enough to have now I have two things that I love. I have, you know, and, and it's, it's a gift and a curse because it's a gift because it's, again, I, I get to do two things that I enjoy thoroughly, but it's a curse because I'm absolutely overextended doing two full-time jobs. You have not backed off of the film editing at all. You're still doing that with the no, same- Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a producer over at HBO and um, I do that nine to five or, or 10 to six uh, to be more specific. Um, but on my train commutes, um, I have an hour going in, I have an hour lunch break, I have an hour coming home, and then I spend two to three hours after dinner, and then I have the weekend. So it's a lot of, you know, accounting, purchasing, social media, um, man, you know, talking to the staff and coordinating our plans throughout the day. Um, up until recently, I would say the first three years, I also went to the farm between 6 and 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Um, to kind of manage the staff and train the staff. Um, and I would do the farmers markets on the weekends as well. And and luckily, we have such a great crew there now that I've been able to back away and spend a little bit more time with my family, which is is vitally important. I hear that. Um, so, how big is the staff at the farm now? It, it depends on the seasons. We're about four or five employees, um, and we also have some incredibly dedicated volunteers that that you know sometimes are even with us. You know, ten twenty hours a week. Um, my family comes to pitch in, you know, like I think my mother comes three times a week to clean eggs. <laughs> um, you know, like my father will help with a lot of the, like the um, construction or electrical work and stuff. So it's, 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 we have a staff of about five people, but it, it sometimes feels like 10 just based on the, the community and the volunteers. So now we get to a key point. Tom is still a video producer. He's done what our friend Dory Clark talked about a few months ago. He's created an excellent side hustle. Tom's become an expert at the thing he loves. He's put himself out there, and it's been paying off, even in the midst of a pandemic. And yet, he's not backing off the original career. So I asked him why he decided to keep doing both. Part of it is, is honestly, up until recently, is mostly about survival. Um, it's just because I couldn't afford to. I, From what I can gather, the food industry and the restaurant industry, farming and agriculture are two of the toughest industries to get into. And and I think the, the failure rate is pretty high. Um, so a huge part of it is just not being able to afford to only do one of them. Hmm. Um, I think, you know, as, as the farm grew and grew and grew, um, it's getting to the point where, yes, maybe I could choose one path or the other. Um, and the farm could just be an investment and I stay, you know, as a producer or I leave the producer role and I just go to the farm full time. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not there yet. Um, and I think part of it is just difficult because I love both. Um, but I do think that most people that have some sort of side hustle normally start that side hustle to transition to that full time. 
Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it, it's an interesting position to be in, but I, I'm with the way things are right now, not just because of the pandemic, but just in general, being five years into this, I'm still not at a point in any way um, to be able to make that decision. Mm -hmm. What advice might you have for somebody who is interested in starting to farm outside um, of a major urban area? I made a ton of mistakes along the way. Um, and I, I think, I mean, first and foremost, you have to realize like failure is just a part of success. You know, you're going to fail just as long as you learn from it. That's great. That means you're, you're trying, you're motivated. Um, and, and this probably applies to multiple industries, but it's just don't overextend yourself, especially in, in farming in terms of the, um, the crops you grow. Um, because that was my mistake is I was growing. I was like, I want to grow garlic and tomatoes and basil and a plethora of items. Um, and then when you go to a restaurant or you start a market or you go to a farmer's market, you only have a little bit of everything. And, you know, so you're going to sell out very quickly of those few things. And a restaurant's going to be like, well, I need 20 pounds of something, not five. Um, so I kind of started to fine tune and, and grow a certain number, like the chickens, for example, you know, we, we realized there was a demand for that. And then we went all in on that, um, and scaled back some of the field crops. So, um, you know, I, w I would really try to fine tune one or two things in particular and then branch out and don't try to just go in guns, guns blazing and, and do it all at once. Cause it's, it doesn't look good sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any lucky breaks along the way? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's been, um, a couple of restaurants that they really support us amazingly. Um, they, you know, they'll, they'll buy several hundred dollars of produce from us a week. So it's, you know, and, and they don't have to, they can go out and get eggs for cheaper, I'm sure, but they want to support farms and they also want their customers to get, you know, a good quality, fresh product, which is great. Um, we received a lot of grants along the way. So, I mean, the community, not just from joining our CSA or from donating, um, your tax dollars go to the Department of Agriculture, who n provides grants to farmers. Uh, two of our greenhouses were provided by grants, which is from you, the taxpayers. Um, so there's, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of breaks along the way, a lot of help from sources that we didn't even think we would, you know, get help from. I mean, we won a, a grant from uh, Squarespace in the New York Knicks a couple of years ago. Um, so it's it's just there's a lot of support for for farming and agriculture so it's a really fun and exciting industry to get in and it's hard but it's incredibly fun as well you know to bring us full circle tom we're we're in this moment where a lot of people are spending a lot of time at home a lot of people are rethinking the way that they're eating what do you hope for your profession as we come out of this um since a lot of people are looking to source local food and 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 um you know reach out to farms to see if they can they can get their food locally and fresher. Um, I hope that that trend stays or those um, customers stay because they realize that supporting the local farms is important. They're also getting better quality food from them. Um, so I, I kind of hope that um, they're introduced into something this year and that they'll stay with it next year and going forward. I caught up with Tom in May. We were still in the midst of the pandemic's early uncertainty. So now that it's September, I wanted to see what's happened. I gave Tom a call to see if he'd gotten that loan. We did, luckily. It was called the Paychecks Protection Program. It was um, through the government to help small businesses with two months of, of payroll for, for employees. But yeah, so we got the loan um, that, that helped us greatly. And um, yeah, we, we're to, we're actually. I didn't think we would still be doing curbside pickup in August, but we still are. Um, two weeks ago, we actually opened our market up on Sundays, so we do curbside pickup on Saturdays, and we have an open market on Sundays. And we were just not sure how that was going to go. Like, were people going to come? Were people going to abide by the rules and wear masks? And you know, we ask all the customers to wear gloves when they're dealing with the produce, and and our customers are, are still supporting us. It's it's been really great, and. Uh, yeah, we're making the best of it. <laughs> what was the experience of opening the market like again two weeks ago? Believe it or not, like as as a business owner, you want you want a crowd. You want people to come and purchase your product or your service. And and on so on the one hand, you're like, yeah, I would love it if a hundred people came. 
Um, and on the other hand, you're like, no, we have to we have to have social distancing. We, we also don't want people waiting. So we tried to just play it safe. And we actually did have a local band. We had some live music out in the parking lot um, just in case cars lined up or people lined up. They had music to listen to. Um, you know, children could walk up to the fence and feed the chickens. And and we reopened the market. And it's and again, it wasn't too crowded. I almost want to say it was just right. We were very lucky about that. That's great. So, you know, you had said that before the pandemic, one significant source of revenue for you was was restaurants. And suddenly restaurants weren't ordering vegetables anymore. I imagine many of them have had to close. I don't know that, though. Um, what's happened with that so far? So, you know, we just started the restaurants just started to come back. And then here in New York, we had a storm that killed power to part of Westchester County for a whole week. So we're, it's just brutal. It's just brutal. This year, this year is something else. But um, 2020. You know, we're, yeah. <laughs> we're But we're also, you know, we're finding new and unique things to do. For example, we, um, you know, like one of the restaurants we work with, Paul Patina, we just sent him over 100 pounds of tomatoes and we said, let's team up and make sauce. Let's, dr- let's jar sauce. Um, we don't have a commercial kitchen. You do. Um, and, and that's something, you know, value added product that him and I can, can sell down the line. So it's, it's about find, you know, finding new and innovative, innovative ways to deal with this. Um, but you know, we, we've been very fortunate that a lot of our restaurants, um, are slowly starting to, to open up and reorder. So it's, it's, it's comforting in that sense. What's your biggest hope for the remainder of the year? You know, I think running a business here in New York, it seems like, um, we've done things smart and safely. I just hope we stay on that path that it's moderately safe and everyone's comfortable and we get that we stay safe and just work our way out of this appropriately and not, not hit another spike or not bounce back. Yeah. I hope for that too. Do you think that in five years, it's more likely that you will be a producer or a farmer? <laughs> Um, you know, it's funny. I, I, I've been thinking about that a lot recently. Like I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying both so much that I think just marrying them more and more. Cause I mean, it could be something where I, I love telling stories. So it could be something where I'm producing stories for and about the farm or for and about agriculture and sustainability and the food system, because there's so many good stories, whether it's starting up a business or, um, you know, the rise of organic and sustainable food and and healing the environment while we're doing that. If I could tell stories in that realm, um, I'd be in heaven. So that's kind of where I'm hoping I'm headed. That was Tom Deacon. You can visit his farm and learn more about their CSA virtually at fablefoods.com. So which of your passion projects have grown and blossomed during this incredibly unusual year? Where are you putting your time? How's it paying off? I hope you'll join me this week to talk it over at Hello Monday's Office Hours. Our producer Sarah Storm and I get together every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern and go live from my LinkedIn profile. It really is our coffee break, a chance for us to visit with each other and with listeners and to talk about the episode. How are you balancing doing the things you love against working from home or searching for your next job? I hope you'll come and share your thoughts with us. Now, if you like the show, please rate us on Apple Podcasts. It really does help new listeners find us. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show is produced by Sarah Storm with help from Madison Schaefer. Joe DeGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Iriando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Victoria Taylor and Juliette Ferro cannot wait to visit Fable with us when we can take field trips again. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. You also heard music from Poddington Bear. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. See you next Monday. Thanks for listening. The reason I'm wearing sunglasses, uh, last night I was um, I was harvesting our second round of honey out of these hives. And um, I, again, I played everything safe. I wore the whole bee suit. We extracted the honey, um, walked over to my car. And that's 30 yards away from the apiary and um, got out of the bee suit. And the minute I took it off, one stung me in the face right near my eye. So, um, again, that's why I'm wearing these sunglasses. My face is swollen.